Hello, this is Dr. Christy Patton Lokes, a chemical engineering professor at Missouri S&T. In this video lesson, we're going to kick off chapter nine, which is refrigeration and liquefaction. So let's start by looking at the Carnot refrigerator. So no matter what you think, a refrigerator is, for our purposes, a refrigerator is a device that operates in a cycle so it goes through a series of steps that come back to the original, and it absorbs heat from a low temperature and rejects that heat to a higher temperature. Now generally, the low temperature is at a uh, temperature less than the surroundings, and the high temperature is at roughly the surroundings temperature. Um, this is going to only be possible to do if you have work input to the cycle, and we saw that when we looked at the second law. Now, as part of that, we also discussed uh, efficiencies and measures of efficiency. And one thing that we learned is that the maximum possible efficiency for any cycle will be for the Carnot cycle. Now, this is true for both refrigeration cycles and power cycles. But we measure things differently in a refrigeration cycle. So, what is a Carnot's refrigeration uh, cycle? I mean, really, it's in a Carnot, it's just the reverse of a Carnot power cycle. And so we still end up with things that say things like the net work is the net heat transfer. But we also have some signs that are going to be different. And in fact, every sign will be the opposite of what we had in the Carnot refrigerator. So the net work is going to be positive because it's into the system. And the heat transfer at the cold temperature is going to be positive, meaning it's into the temp system at the cold temperature, and QH is negative in, at the high temperature, um, meaning it's lost at the high temperature. Another difference is the way we measure the effectiveness. So we use the coefficient of performance, omega. And this is what we get out of the cycle divided by what it costs. In this case, we are wanting to absorb heat from, say, our food in our refrigerator. So it's heat absorbed, but it's at the lower temperature. So heat absorbed at the lower temperature is our goal, what we're going to get out of the cycle, and what we have to put into it is the net work or power. And so QC over W is this ratio. Now it's going to be greater than 1, so we're going to call it a coefficient of performance, not an efficiency, because that's reserved for uh, things that are between 0 and 1. If you combine this with our uh, definitions back from chapter 5 when we studied the second law, what we'll see is that the coefficient of performance can be estimated for a Carnot cycle as Tc over Th minus Tc. Now, in general, this is the maximum possible coefficient of performance. And if you look at this, what you're going to hopefully notice is that um, if I increase T sub C, then I'm going to have a larger numerator okay but i will also have a change in my denominator unless i also change th and so the refrigeration effect per unit work is going to decrease as t sub c decreases and t sub h increases so just like in power cycles uh carnot cycle is not the practical answer and so, how do we really build a refrigerator? And most of the time, what we do is vapor compression cycles. So what we have shown here is a diagram of a basic vapor compression system. Uh, this is essentially how your refrigerator works or how your home or car air conditioning systems work. In many senses, this is a reversed Rankine cycle where you're doing almost the opposite of what you did in every case, 
with the exception of the reversed pump is impractical, um, so therefore we're going to replace it with a throttling valve. But we're going to start first with an evaporator. So we're going to have some material here, and it's at a low temperature. And we are going to take this liquid or liquid vapor mixture, if you see here, this is a liquid vapor mixture, and we're going to boil it, okay, or evaporate it to turn it into a vapor. Now this is at a low pressure and a low temperature, so we don't usually call it boiling, but that's kind of semantics. Uh, so we call it evaporation, same process. We're going to start with a liquid and end with a vapor. Now this vapor I need to compress to a high energy level or high pressure. And so I'm going to have some work input at this system, at this point in the system. And it's going to come out at a higher pressure. Ideally, this is going to be isentropic, which is the state 3 prime shown here. But the reality is there'll be some increase in entropy. I now need to start the process of returning my material to its original state. So I'm going to then condense this vapor back into a liquid. This is going to be at a higher temperature and in this case I'm going to be um, giving off heat Okay, this is my high temperature. My evaporator was bringing in heat in order to vaporize this liquid. Now then, it's giving off heat. This is at a higher temperature um, than the evaporator operates. And so now that I have a liquid, and I need to get it down to a lower pressure. Now with a gas, to go from a high to a low pressure, I used a turbine. But in for liquids, a liquid turbine is an impractical device. It tends to be very expensive, needs a lot of maintenance. And so instead we do the inexpensive, uh, no operating cost throttling valve. So let's now look at what um, we can learn about this. So if you look at these with a little more detail, the evaporator from one to two is going to be the liquid refrigerant evaporating at constant temperature and pressure, typically. We're gonna absorb heat, and this is the refrigeration effect, okay? So this is our goal, Q at the cold temperature. That's our goal here. Uh, we're gonna assume that this is constant pressure and usually constant temperature. The compressor ideally will operate isentropically. Reversible plus adiabatic is isentropic. And so that's going to be our ideal compressor. But in reality, we know that there will be a lot of friction involved with this, and so we will have some irreversibilities causing delta S to be positive. Next, I need to go through my condenser. I'm going to have my vapor cooled and it's going to be then condensed so that it rejects heat. So this is going to be Q at the high temperature or the hot temperature. And then finally I have a throttling valve which expands the liquid to the original pressure. It will partially evaporate this, but there's no work or heat transfer involved in this. So typically, I'm going to have in the evaporator and the condenser, the work will be zero. In my compressor, the heat transfer will be zero. And in my throttling valve, both work and heat transfer will be zero. If you look at the first law, assuming kinetic and potential energy changes are negligible, I end up with just the Q's are delta H's, W, delta H, my coefficient of performance here. And then I can also use this to estimate a mass flow rate. This is the cooling load. How much? refrigeration is required 
to maintain that temperature inside the refrigerator, etc. And based on my Q sub C calculation here, I can use this to estimate the mass flow rate of my fluid. So we're going to take a break in the video here, and we're going to come back and look at a more detailed analysis of this vapor compression refrigeration. Thank you very much for your time.